Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're about to get started, and uh, I'm going to turn things over to our board president, Maurice Ball. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Ball, and I serve as the president of the board of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. So for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, um, the Alliance aims to be the, the best source of information about what high-speed rail is and its benefits. We also work to support elected officials and other local leaders working to achieve this goal. Uh, the Alliance is a nonprofit organization and individual members and donors like yourself provide most of our support. So thank you for that. Um, we have a paid staff, but many of us uh, including myself uh, and, and our, our entire board of directors serve as volunteers. Uh, we do this mainly because we are just very deeply passionate and interested in seeing better train service in, in North America. Um, a little bit about me, I am a, a originally from uh, Houston, Texas. I'm a mechanical engineer and I currently work at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in uh, Batavia, Illinois. And, uh, and when I'm not working, I, I volunteer my time uh, with uh, the High Speed Rail uh, Alliance. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. In fact, I have my High Speed Rail Alliance t-shirt uh, of which you all could get one too if you're, if you're very interested. Um, we'd like to introduce you to uh, our other board members and other volunteers in future talks. But as our president, I wanted to just welcome you uh, and take this opportunity uh, to, to kick this off myself. So um, for now, I'll, um, no further ado, I'll turn this over to our executive director, uh, Mr. Rick Harnish, and he'll set the stage for today's talk by talking about the importance of regional rail. Thank you. So th thank you, Maurice. Uh, I'm Rick Harnish, executive director. Uh, so I'm really excited about today's presentation. For various reasons, in the 60s, the country decided that trains should be focused on getting people from suburbs to downtowns. Um, and that was primarily their purpose was to serve that one market. Uh, but trains can do a lot more than that. And they can serve people who are going from downtown to suburbs or from suburb to suburb, uh, not just for work, for uh, pleasure, to go see a movie, buy, to go get groceries, to go meet with friends for lunch, uh, but in order to do that, the trains need to run throughout the day, uh, work in both directions, and have very predictable schedules. And that's what we call regional rail. Um, I'm very excited to have our guest, uh, David Kralik, the Director of uh, Planning and Programming at Metra, who is leading the effort to uh, build this future at Metra of Metra Regional Rail. So uh, we've known each other for a long time. I'm excited about the work he's doing and I'm so glad that he can share it with us today. And with that, David, I'll let you take it. Thanks so much, Rick. And thanks very much for the opportunity to, to come and present to this group. Uh, we, we at Metro value the opportunity to engage in dialogue on what we're doing. And, um, and we recognize that uh, the advocacy that the High Speed Rail Alliance does and particularly it's advocacy for um, for your local hometown railroad, uh, us here at Metro is important. And so uh, I'm excited to come and share the, really our strategic vision of regional rail, how we are moving towards regional rail within what we put together in our strategic plan and some other activities within that. And uh, I'll be excited to engage in some Q&A uh, after I get through uh, a few slides with you. There we go. So about a year and a half ago, back in late 2021, as we're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Metro determined that it was the right time to take stock and chart our future paths. So in 2018, we had adopted our agency's first ever strategic plan. We called it On Track to Excellence. That plan focused on our operating and capital needs. Uh, the end of that plan's five-year horizon was fast approaching uh, as it was coming up to 2022, and it was time for us to revisit uh, the strategic planning process. 
We know we were dealing with a dramatically different world than we were when we developed our first plan with challenges ranging from new and changing travel patterns, changes in operating and capital funding needs, calls to be more responsive to equity and climate change, all while working in the most complex railroad operating environment in North America, and still trying to attract and retain employees to provide essential transit service. So in response, we developed a new plan, My Metro, Our Future. This sets our course for the next five years and helps us to respond to those persistent challenges. So we started by building on the value that we provide to the region, from connecting people to destinations, providing an alternative to driving, contributing to sustainable land use development, reducing the region's greenhouse gas emissions, attracting businesses to the region, creating jobs, saving riders time and money, and reducing traffic congestion. We knew we had a strong base to build on. And we started with a good sense of who we were and who we are. Our mission, uh, which we modified a little bit, is to provide safe, reliable, efficient, and affordable commuter rail that enhances the economic and environmental health of Northeast Illinois. Commuter rail in our vision focuses on work trips in the downtown core. Of course, other trips were always possible on Metro, but the nine to five Monday to Friday trips were really our bread and butter uh, in terms of ridership. As we came through the changes of the pandemic and heard the calls to become something more than just commuter rail, we developed a vision statement of what we aspire to. To proactively address evolving transportation needs, Metro will provide regional rail service that supports sustainable connected communities. Now the table here details some characteristics and distinctions between how we view commuter rail and regional rail and what we've uh, learned from a lot of this through this process. Essentially regional rail provides service at regular intervals with consistent stopping patterns throughout the day. It's not just oriented around bringing commuters to the urban center. And while significant rush hour service will still be present, we wanna to evolve to become an all day transportation option for many different types of trips throughout the region. So as part of this plan, we identified five strategic goals and regional rail is really at the heart of each one of them. So in addition to being that key of our vision statement, it's really bubbled through here. So enhancing service to grow ridership and provide mobility choices is uh, one of the ultimate aims of regional rail. If we can offer more memorable schedules and regular stopping patterns, we can ensure that metro, the metro experience is safe, easy, and enjoyable for all our customers. Providing consistent service to all parts of the region helps us to attract and retain a diverse workforce and invest in our employees. Our movement toward regional rail while maybe more common in other parts of the world, is an innovation for us that will allow us to become more efficient and effective. And providing consistent service throughout the day is a key element of our commitment to equity and sustainability. Sorry about that. Skipping too far ahead. There we go. So during the pandemic, uh, we really began this evolution towards regional rail. And we did this by working on new schedules to anticipate and respond to the changes in travel patterns and incorporate these longer term goals. We established service principles to focus um, and focus on ideas and establish common services across all of our rail lines. So those service principles are to provide consistent and frequent service throughout the day with easily understandable schedules, with memorable service patterns, including new express service when possible, considering transfers both within the Metro network and to and from other transit services, exploring reverse commute and new ridership markets and promoting regional equity. One of the ways that we've already done this is to retime our midday trips to make it easier to make connections between Metro lines and to and from other operators. Schedules we've rolled out have been reimagined with more midday service, more regular frequencies, and simpler service patterns. We've already provide, we're already providing more midday service than before the pandemic on the BNSF, uh, UP West, and UP North lines. This provides more flexibility to riders uh, reflecting current travel patterns and has led to several efforts to guide our further progress. So the first initiative I'd like to talk to you about is our route restoration study. So this is an FDA funded study that uh, we secured a grant for 
uh, we're going out to use big data from our cell phone location services in order to better understand our current travel demand patterns. We'll incorporate these findings into near-term service changes. Um, we've enlisted the assistance of HNTV to work with us in this, and this effort will help us to tell how we can work with our existing infrastructure and our existing rolling stock to best serve our current trip making. So this is more about the near term, what can we do coming out of uh, the pandemic and going into the next few years. The second effort, which we kicked off uh, just this past month, is what we're calling our system-wide network plan. And this is gonna build off the results of that route restoration study in order to determine how we can evolve to better serve new and changing travel markets in the decades to come. The results will guide metric or capital investments over the next two to 20 years. So unlike the route restoration study, the system-wide network plan will not be limited by the existing infrastructure and rolling stock. It will allow us to develop and test some more advanced regional rail concepts, like more ro robustly serving destinations like O'Hare Airport and better connecting with future Amtrak service. So really the route restoration study is the, the data analysis and market study that starts this process, system-wide network plan helps us to implement that in the longer term and connect with how these some of these elements can proceed forward. So a third in initiative we have underway works to ensure that we have the land use and customers to take advantage of regional rail service. We're in the process of actively reevaluating commuter parking demand at outlying stations so that we can develop a uh, defined approach to transit-oriented development and commuter parking. So while we've been coordinating with uh, TOD studies and TOD efforts from communities for many years, um, this concentrated approach and well-defined approach will allow us to better respond when we have community inquiries that come in, um, allow us to make sure that we're providing cons consistent responses, consistent standards, or using consistent standards to evaluate redevelopment opportunities. Um, and we'll continue and extend that uh, ongoing coordination that we've had for a while. Help to identify areas of excess parking for redevelopment, including potential land swaps, and help us to provide a consistent response to community developer proposals. However, we know that achieving this vision of regional rail will not be easy. We can't simply flip a switch and become a regional rail operator. We'll take more funding to operate the level of service we used to operate, let alone the increased service levels necessary to achieve regional rail. We'll need transit supportive land use and strong first and last mile connections. And we'll need the cooperation of freight rail partners and other key stakeholders um, and advocates like you. So we're excited to talk more about this. In addition to regional rail, Metro's had a few things pop up in the last few weeks that I wanted to uh, give a little bit of background on that help to build our regional rail vision, uh, but are also uh, working together with this. So uh, a few weeks ago, we released uh, a proposal for fare zone consolidation. Essentially, the proposed fares are gonna be consolidated based on service, geography, and ridership characteristics. And as you see in the map, it will slim our existing system down into only four zones, uh, essentially three outlying zones and a downtown core zone. That downtown zone will allow us to price trips to and from downtown differently than we price trips on the rest of the line, thereby encouraging intermediate trips uh, while pricing downtown trips appropriately. Um, your price willingness to pay for uh, a trip into a location where it's 20 to $30 a day to park is gonna be very different than uh, people's willingness to pay for areas in the suburbs where we have free parking. Uh, throughout or at many locations. So that red zone is the, the downtown zone. Uh, we developed this coming out of My Metro, Our Future, our, uh, the strategic plan I talked about, and it aligns with those strategic goals. If you want more details than I'm giving here, this is not intended to be a exhaustive uh, description of the fair proposal, uh, but we've set up a section of our website, go to metro.com slash 2024 fair plan. Um, that you can get to it also just from the front page of our website at metro.com. Uh, it'll have more details on the proposal itself and also an opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, we're in that open feedback process right now. This will be, this will 
uh, inform our budget process and our programming process as we lead into that in the fall so that we can hit the ground running with a concrete proposal that we've uh, refined and uh, can move forward with on that. So another piece that's been in the news recently is last week, um, it was announced that IDOT was that IDOT selected Metra as the operator of passenger rail service to Rockford. So we knew uh, we've been in conversation with IDOT and the team there for uh, several years. We had known for a while that the selected route along the Milwaukee West line uh, would allow us to act as the host railroad for the service between Chicago and Elgin. Uh, the service will uh, connect from our, our alignment to the UP alignment uh, at Big Timber or close to Big Timber, um, and then operate on UP from Elgin into UP tracks from Elgin into Rockford. So the difference in the, the new announcement is that uh, instead of Amtrak being the inner city operator for this service, um, that Metro is selected as the operator. Um, the intermediate stops that have been identified at this point are in uh, Huntley, Belvedere, and in Elgin. Um, and this is a, an, an inner city service. It's not, uh, not an extension of Metro service. This is not, um, we spend a lot of time defining what this is not, but this is not uh, will not require uh, the additional counties to join into uh, the RTA service territory. This is service that's being provided and funded uh, by the state. We are merely the operator of this service. And as such, IDOT's going to be responsible for all the planning, uh, station stops, construction agreements, and all funding, uh, including capital and operating for this service. We're clearly working very closely with them. We'll continue to do that and continue to work to bring this service to fruition uh, to connect Chicago and Rockford and points in between uh, in the coming years. So with that, uh, so, uh, I'm happy to really spend the bulk of our time uh, answering some questions and going back and forth with you. Great, and if you could uh, unshare your screen. Uh, excellent. That was a very helpful. Um, I'm glad to see your map that looks very similar to our Crossrails proposal from uh, 10 years ago. Um, and hopefully someday we can have high quality train service to O'Hare, one of the biggest generators. Uh, but on that, you also had, um, uh, oh, I, there's one thing I wanted to to show real quick uh, before we got into questions and answers. Maurice talked about our t-shirts. We also have hats. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you would like to support these efforts with these webinars and these great speakers, please go to hsrail.org and either hit the donate button or uh, go to swag, hsrail.org slash swag, and you can get a hat or a t-shirt or some posters, et cetera. So again, thank you all for supporting our efforts and uh, our ability to keep promoting things like Metro Regional Rail. So coming back to questions, David, um, uh, you know, I frequently tell the story about going kind of the, um, in Karate Kid where they get, kid goes and waxes the cars and he doesn't understand why. I spent a weekend like that with an, an older gentleman in the late 1990s where he talked about rolling stock design. I went to go talk to him about marketing. He used to be the VP of marketing at a passenger railroad. And he spent the first half of our, our time together talking about rolling stock design. And I said, I don't get it. And he said, it all starts with the train. So the question is, in your view, what role does rolling stock design play in transitioning to regional rail? It's it's clearly a big part of that, and that's um, we're moving forward. You know, so we're starting the the rolling stock conversation uh, somewhat with uh, both arms tied behind our back because of the rolling stock uh, challenges that we have. Not because of that our rolling stock is um, is inadequate in that, but because of just the incredible uh, age of our rolling stock. Uh, we have uh, cars out there that are eligible for social security. Um, and uh, so we're, uh, there's, there's a process that's, that's underway right now to bring new, um, new gallery cars or new replacements for gallery cars that will be uh, full bi-level um, vehicles onto our system in order to do that. So that's, 
that's a, the, the first step in that is being able to have a process that gets us um, to uh, replace some of our m oldest, uh, oldest fleet in order to keep the service running while we work to transition that. Um, some other um, elements that we have moving forward is we uh, recognize that uh, while one of the biggest things that uh, transit can do to uh, shift the needle on climate change is to get more people onto the service. Um, we're always talking about mode shift as the first and foremost, but as we continue to talk about mode shift, looking at different types of mode of power um, is, is kind of the next part of the, the conversation, um, both in uh, our response to uh, providing greener solutions and uh, providing more flexible solutions. So we have uh, an RFP out there that we've solicited uh, responses for, for um, the for uh, zero emission train sets, these would be uh, smaller uh, train sets that would be more flexible, would be zero emissions. So um, the anticipation, we were not uh, specific into the um, how this would sp be provided in the details of our RFP, but uh, we were we wanted to make sure that they were going to be zero point emissions um, or zero emissions at the uh, point of delivery, and so battery or other solutions uh, would be possible. Um, we believe that those are going to be ideal for uh, the types of shorter trips that we do have in our system and that we're looking to experience, um, looking to grow uh, for markets that may not, may not have the um, fill uh, a thousand passengers up uh, on an express train from an outlying suburb into downtown for the work trip, but things that are more flexible uh, within that. So we're looking at um, and hoping to uh, be able to move forward on that. We did get some uh, some promising news uh, from the uh, from CMAP uh, last week um, and getting into this week that uh, we had requested uh, and applied for uh, CMAP funding for uh, the zero emission uh, train sets, um, that was the highest rated project in uh, among the CMAP staff um, for this. And so we are working with them to, um, as that as the CMAP program goes out for public comment and goes through its further iterations, it's not a um, done deal, but that would be a significant investment in um, zero emission uh, train sets for us moving forward and securing funding to do that, so. Excellent. And then the other is uh, kind of big picture question is Amtrak has proposed the Chicago Hub Improvement Program, uh, which includes uh, some much needed upgrades to and safety improvements to Union Station, uh, hopefully the ability to run through Union Station. And when I first started 30 years ago in this, everybody said, you're completely crazy to ever talk about a direct connection from Union Station to the St. Charles Airline and to the Rock Island and to the CN, but Amtrak's proposing it. So it's called the Chicago Hub Improvement Program, which really changes the, the, the patterns you can have for services. How does that fit into this discussion about regional rail? Sure, so two, piece, two several points to that. So the CHIP program, as you said, involves uh, multiple elements to that. Um, CUS is where um, the majority of Metro's lines terminate right now. Um, and we want to, uh, and, and will into the future, um, we wanna make sure that that uh, process, and that's, that's a high quality station. And so there's station concourse improvements that are part of it that we're highly supportive of. But the connection to the St. Charles Airline is, a, is another key element that, um, that needs to happen and that we think we'll, we'll be able to mutual, provide mutual benefit uh, for, um, for Amtrak services and for future connections as you're discussing. That's part of the questions that we're really gonna be uh, delving into in our system-wide network plan. We don't know exactly how, um, how we will use that or how we, the collective we, Amtrak, Metra, um, and um, any other operators being able to connect through that, but we are um, we're excited for that prospect, more connectivity, more 
flexibility, more fluidity to the network is, is really important and helps us to deliver that. Um, so we have been an uh, active supporter of uh, the CHIP program um, and providing uh, local match to grant applications, providing uh, coordination with them as design progresses on individual elements of this. Um, and we are working with Amtrak to that uh, the St. Charles Airline connector is, as you referenced, is key to being able to provide um, the, the completion of the, um, uh, the results of the Chicago St. Louis uh, EIS from a number of years ago that uh, recommended uh, relocating Amtrak service from the CN Metro Heritage Corridor alignment that it currently operates on over to the Rock Island alignment. And so we've been working with Amtrak to make sure that uh, the improvements that we're looking to make on the Rock Island alignment are, uh, will, um, that we can collectively uh, work to a project that improves the Rock Island al uh, alignment and will support uh, future Amtrak operation on that alignment and being able to connect onto the St. Charles airline and then onto the Rock Island is, um, is a key element of that. You know, I, I had the misfortune of trying to come north on the Dan Ryan just as the Sox game was getting out. Um, and so they had a lot of time to view that huge throng, not only going to the CTA, but to the Metro Blue Island stop, not Blue Island, IIT. Right. Stop. Yeah. Um, and wouldn't it be great if Sox fans could get on? Um, I know in the Northwest suburbs, there aren't a lot, but if they could get on a train in the Northwest suburbs and go right to Sox Park, uh, that probably would have some benefit to the region. There, wait, you're saying there's Sox fans north of Madison Street? That is... <laughs> no, I'm not sure it happens. And then uh, certainly Hyde Park to O'Hare has some value. Absolutely. But, um, again, thank you. And uh, we'll go to questions, Chris, if we've got any, uh, I'm sure we've got questions from the audience. Uh, Chris, if you could work on that. We certainly do. And uh, and thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, so uh, to kick things off, uh, David, uh, we have a question from Abe, uh, who's asking about uh, how this concept of regional rail is going over, I guess, in the in the rest of the country. He asks, what is your sense of the broader US commuter rail industry's adoption of these concepts? I think uh, I wasn't able to make it, but I think you guys heard from the MBTA folks about, or some folks in Boston about their uh, perspectives on this recently. It, uh, it clearly, I, I think this, the movement towards regional rail has been one um, that has had interest um, across the U.S. and North America for a number of years, but I think uh, clearly the the biggest lasting impacts uh, for us in uh, in transit and in rail operations of the COVID pandemic is the shift to remote work and the fact that um, more of our folks are uh, more more. Uh, folks who used to be our riders are riding less frequently or not at all. And I think that has served as a, a wake up call for the entire transit agent industry, but especially uh, commuter rail agencies who um, had a higher proportion of um, downtown workers, regardless of the, the region. And so it's not only a, it, it, it's a time who, or it's a concept whose time has really been and its priority has been accelerated with that recent shift to um, or recent acceleration of the shift to remote work. Um, I believe that that's something that you're going to continue to see in, um, in other regions and being able to more fully utilize the rail networks that we have to make trips that are not just about nine to five, um, nine to five jobs in the central business district but being able to allow us to serve those other pieces. That's what we're really trying to move towards. Uh, the downtown commute is still gonna be a part of our uh, core business, but uh, expanding out and making, a, making our system into one that will really allow us to um, better provide those opportunities to other, uh, other trip types. Okay, 
Thank you. And running with that, here's a, a question which I guess uh, gets into you know the ability to to forecast that. The the question is how is Metra adapting its ridership estimates and station service areas during this transition to regional mail rail? Uh, previous ridership practices were based largely on parking usage and service areas that didn't have much relation uh, with which stations and lines people chose. Sure, and and I'll point back to one of the things that that I mentioned briefly in the in my deck that uh, we are uh, clearly revisiting uh, what those parking needs are um, and what our what our station access access plans can be. Um, there's no doubt that there are locations where we had excess parking in 2019 and that uh, before the pandemic and that a lot of those um, locations uh, where we had more parking than we needed in 2019, we definitely have more parking than we needed today as we're getting back to 60% um, uh, recovery system wide, uh, different line to the line, different day to day, um, but um, our ability to, to move towards that, um, we'll see different levels of demand throughout the system. Um, and so what we're doing is we're taking that, taking our best estimates of how quickly ridership will uh, return and uh, aligning those with regional growth estimates from uh, that are developed by CMAP, putting those together, matching those up with uh, how we can look at uh, the parking availability and land use surrounding our stations and then working with the communities because although uh, we have nearly 90,000 commuter parking spaces uh, serving Metro stations in the region, only about 10,000 of those are uh, owned and operated by Metro. The other, other 80,000 have a mix of different ownership, different, um, different operating agreements that are you know, not only different station to station, but lot to lot, but also even within a specific lot. And so it's a, it, uh, again, it's a, it's a process for us to go through um, those efforts, uh, but we have um, had some significant successes in those already in locations where uh, communities have come to us and saying, hey, we're interested in uh, a different type of development pattern, um, maybe looking at different ways to use uh, the commuter parking lots in, um, in the, in surrounding the station. Um, and one thing that we found has been particularly successful is to um, allow, uh, allow us to get out of the way of development. That's kind of the, um, one of the minimum things we can do. And so when there's uh, state, federal, or metro interest in a parking lot that really um, is, is not needed for uh, meeting demand and has opportunities to um, to move into a more transit-oriented development pattern. We've been able to work with the community um, in several locations to swap land so that the federal interest can be retained into um, at least a footprint that is probably likely to be in, in commuter use or in railroad use for, uh, for the foreseeable future and allow development to, to proceed forward. We've done this at Glenview, we're working through this in Oak Forest um, and um, let's see where else, uh, Itasca and several other communities that we've been working through to figure out at a minimum, how can we get, um, get that into local control where they have more of an ability to, uh, to shape that into um, trans-oriented development and supportive land use um, and work with them while still making sure that we have a, a plan to meet both our um, needs today and our long-term future, but recognizing that that long-term future of what we're seeing now is different from what it was uh, five or 10 years ago. Thank you. And uh, Greg has a question about the shift to regional rail and you know what it will mean. Uh, he's looking for more information about what it will mean for weekend service, uh, saying that the two-hour headways currently on some lines can really discourage use because it's not very convenient. What might uh, weekend service, can you say more about what weekend service might look like under regional rail? So I think that's still part of what we're defining out in both these studies that we have going on forward. But I will say that um, we, we recognize that as well. Uh, weekend trips are ones that are less likely to be replaced by a Zoom call or a Teams chat or a Teams call. Uh, and so we've, on several of our lines, we're experiencing 
uh, weekend ridership at levels um, at or above our 2019 levels. Um, and we've worked to roll out, um, roll out more service in those areas. It's been a relatively, it's been a slow process for us that we're trying to match, uh, match loads, match ridership with availability, but um, expanding service on the weekend um, is, is definitely one of the things that will be on the table for as we plot our, plot our course for regional rail. And here's a question uh, from Mark about on-time performance. Is there a plan to improve the on-time performance at all stations, not just the terminals? Uh, and he says, in order to rely on Metro for non-downtown travel, trains will really need to be on time at every station. Uh, is there, is, yeah, can you say more about that? So, yeah, so the, we've, we've um, Mark's referencing that we've typically counted on-time performance really as the, at, uh, when the train gets to its end point, um, but there's there's clearly an understanding on our part that in order to uh, to do that, you need to be on time at uh, multiple points along the way. Uh, we we recognize that there that that's part of uh, an ability to depend on this, and that will be part of our um, part of our solution that's out there um, that we uh, work to deploy. It's that often the, the balancing act that we often find ourselves in, in uh, looking to add more service is we wanna make sure we have a, a robust schedule that provides as much service as possible, but we don't want it to be a fragile schedule because if we have a um, schedule that can provide um, a lot of frequency, but uh, only at 80% um, on-time performance or 70 or, you know, um, a really low on-time performance, then that doesn't really benefit people um, and causes riders to, to run into challenges uh, very frequently with the scheduling patterns. And so um, wanting to make sure that we, when we deploy schedules, that they are um, not only providing as robust a service we can, but providing as uh, stable and deliverable service as we can. Because if we're scheduling turn turns too tightly without recovery time. We're scheduling things that don't have an ability to, um, to deal with, um, you know, if, a, if one train's delayed, the more that we can have that be just that train that's delayed and not have a cascading impact on many other trains following that, um, the better solution that it is for, for everyone concerned. And so it's a balancing act that we will continue to, um, to try to address, but it is, it is far from lost on us. Thank you. We also have quite a few questions about electrification or further electrification, uh, such as this one. Um, with all the talk of sustainability, are you planning to electrify the rest of the network to be like the Metro Electric and, and South Shore? So right now our approach to electrification, and we uh, outlined this in our strategic plan, is really to focus on the, um, on the vehicle. We believe that there's a lot of uh, potential, the, the growth and the improvements in battery technology just in the last few years. And as we're looking to see that, as we look to uh, deliver, uh, receive delivery of new rolling stock and, and additional procurements going forward, um, the electrifying the vehicle itself and providing um, charging to that um, at endpoint seems to be the, the best next step forward that we can offer. Uh, we recognize that there's some uh, benefits to uh, that come along with uh, stringing catenary above and providing full electrification of the lines. We also operate in a situation where uh, we you know, operate on two of the busiest freight lines in North America. Um, we have a lot of freight ownership of the lines we operate on. We have freight carriers that still operate some of our service. And the mix of electrification um, and freight and the incredible um, additional cost of uh, that electrification um, throughout the line is, um, is, makes that very challenging for us. So generally right now our approach to, um, to lowering emissions on the vehicle side and to improving, operation, improving uh, operations is to do that through uh, battery locomotives and zero emission train sets. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. And um, just, uh, you know, the, the, you, you uh, in addition to your, your, the answer that you gave about electrification or along the way, you mentioned, you know, some other possibilities for propulsion, and there was some lively discussion of that. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it makes sense to go into the, the details, uh, because we already have a detailed uh, talk about this on our website uh, that, that looks at the zero emission technologies for trains. And if anyone is interested in uh, finding out about that, uh, you can go to our site, hsrail.org slash events. And we have an archive there of all the past talks. This one was, I can't remember exactly when it was, but a few months back, uh, we had a couple of presenters from DB uh, sharing their expertise on uh, electrification, battery power, hydrogen power, things like that. So uh, moving along, uh, we have, as always, uh, we have questions about, I guess, you know, geography and, you know, the possibilities for expanded service to particular areas. Uh, our, our, one of our board members, Beth Colson, asks uh, if you can say more about plans for the Milwaukee district lines. So, uh, you know, I, the system-wide network plan that, that I referenced before is going to look at all of our existing lines and see how we can uh, improve service on those um, to meet the meet our goals and meet our evolution of service towards regional rail on the Milwaukee line specifically, um, as I uh, referenced in in the deck, um, O'Hare is a key driver of that. It's actually technically not on our uh, Milwaukee line; it's on our North Central service, but would generally be served by the the Milwaukee District West line up until. Um, the, the peel off for the, the North Central service. And so operating more service on um, the Milwaukee district line is, uh, is important to that. We work with our, uh, with our dispatching partner, CPKC, um, as they're uh, working on that. Um, but we do, we do think we have some, uh, some definite uh, flexibility in that. And so it was Milwaukee district or it was service to version to, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Just to be sure, I was answering the uh, this one was right question. The Milwaukee district line, but um, but there is a, a question that's coming up about expanded mm -hmm. service in Wisconsin. So, uh, so we'll get to that. Maybe I'll finish this up. But um, so we will be looking at how we can better serve uh, each one of those. Uh, we think the the Milwaukee district uh, West line has some unique opportunities when you look at, uh, particularly when you're in the regional rail um, realm and and looking at uh, increased levels of service. Not only does it have um, O'Hare, not at a terminus, but at uh, you know the ability to connect O'Hare and downtown, but the alignment uh, that the Milwaukee West operates on uh, from a transit perspective is almost in between the, um, or halfway in between the two existing CTA rail lines and serves neighborhoods both in the city and near west suburbs that are um, not really well, um, don't have great access to um, to frequent train service beyond what, what Metro can provide. So there's an opportunity there, uh, both from a demand side, from an ownership side, um, and from a, a destination side to, to look at that. It's also where uh, we have opportunities to connect to uh, the growing uh, business and entertainment district in Fulton Market. Thanks. And then, uh, you know, picking up on those, uh, the interest in other states, we had at least one uh, question about expanded service into Indiana, and then a question here from Larry uh, in, uh, in Appleton, Wisconsin. Will Metra plan as a regional railroad to extend its service in Wisconsin? Sure. So I'll, I'll um, start more broadly um, that when we talk about regional rail, this, um, there, uh, regional rail is clearly a um, has a, a whole host of elements that different agencies will pull into their definitions of this. Um, so while I did make reference to um, the Rockford service that we are uh, offering, that is, uh, as stated, more of an inner city product. And when we're talking about regional rail, we're really trying to uh, focus on uh, growing, uh, growing the frequency and um, travel pat and serving better travel patterns within the six counties of Northeastern Illinois. That's where our uh, taxpayer base is. That's, um, that's our core focus. As such, we, we do coordinate uh, very closely with um, our friends at NICTES who uh, have two large projects underway right now serving uh, Northwest Indiana with their double tracking and 
uh, new line uh, extension. Um, and clearly as they get into Illinois, they operate on our lines and, um, and we have uh, shared interest in the, the Hegwish uh, neighborhood and at the Hegwish station in terms of expanding beyond uh, to other states. Right now we are a unit of, uh, unit of state government uh, in Illinois. It is, it is our intent to retain our focus in Northeastern Illinois. If there are op other opportunities to, um, that the state of Illinois wants to um, engage with us or enter into future possibilities for other service within uh, the state where uh, we're as we were with Rockford, we're uh, open to those conversations and figuring out how um, how the best how the state can best be served from a rail perspective. Uh, but currently, we do not have any plans to um, extend to Wisconsin or Indiana, uh, apart from the uh, grandfathered in service that we already that we've provided at Kenosha for uh, decades now. Okay. Thank you. And uh, speaking as someone who's based in Wisconsin, we'll have to you know, work on that from uh, from this side of uh, uh, these other states' borders. Uh, Lawrence asks, uh, many cities the size of Chicago have very busy service that circles around the inner suburbs, more or less, rather than going to the central business district. Has this been considered by Metra? So uh, there, in what we're considering right now in our uh, in the system-wide network plan, we don't anticipate that large uh, large investments in new lines like that um, would be part of the, the solution that we're identifying. We're trying to see where there are targeted investments that uh, can work within our core uh, to do that. Um, many years ago, I worked, spent a lot of time working on what we called the Star Line at the time, which was a outer circumferential rail service connecting in also along I-90. There were feasibility studies that Metro did um, uh, 20 years ago uh, on inner circumferential rail service. Uh, the biggest challenge for that, at least in um, with the existing corridors that are out there, uh, is that the, one of the successes of the CREATE program and other F efforts that um, freight partners have made is to really fully take it or to do most as much as they can to take advantage of those circumferential corridors, be it um, the Belt Railroads in close to the city, the, uh, the ej and &E on the outer port portions of the region um, to, to route, use those to route rail or route freight rail traffic around the, uh, the central core and um, thereby enabling the radial lines to have uh, more capacity, have more fluidity for, uh, for passenger operations. Um, so the, the result of that is they've really filled up those circumferential corridors with a lot of slow moving freight service, which aren't exactly, aren't always compatible with, um, with commuter or passenger operations. So while there's, you know, we'll never say never and uh, the planner's uh, motto is always not to preclude future uh, possibilities, um, that isn't part of something that we're actively pursuing right now. Andrew asks, is through running Metro service on key lines being considered in Metro's long range, long range vision? And, uh, and Andrew specifically mentions the Alliance's crossrail concept. Thank you. Um, is, uh, is that in your, your vision? And um, related, let me just throw these in because there, there have been several uh, questions from uh, several other people about uh, the difficulty of getting uh, from Union Station to LaSalle Street Station to McCormick Place, Millennium Station, places like that. Um, so yes, those elements are uh, being considered in what we're working towards. There's a host of interconnected and complementary studies that are that are ongoing between um, uh, an operations uh, study that's going up that Amtrak is leading at Union Station that's considering what elements of um, through running might be possible. Um, we're, there are uh, a host of uh, the, the crossrail proposal, as, um, as we're well aware of, um, has a whole host of elements to, that gets you from, uh, or that unites and unifies um, 
projects on different owners and that have different benefits to uh, different types of operations. And so there's different pieces that are going on that will allow that. The, as Rick alluded to earlier with the St. Charles Airline connector, um, exactly what's happening with the, the airline and Amtrak's proposals to route some of their route additional traffic onto the airline and uh, the CN Lakefront line. Um, we're coordinating with them on that, coordinating with our proposal to uh, be able to uh, route trains from, uh, from Union Station onto the Rock Island. Uh, we believe there's also a, an opportunity, we talked about O'Hare before, but connecting O'Hare um, through Union Station to uh, points um, both on the Metro Electric or on the Rock Island. Um, we were in explorations with both of those. Um, the Rock Island is uh, a little more of our uh, immediate focus within that and, and how that will balance out with bringing, uh, bringing Amtrak trains over onto the Rock Island. Uh, but that will, those investments will also support future considerations of operating uh, Rock Island service into, um, into Union Station and through Union Station. Uh, we think that the, the answer to this is, is several fold. So it's not only um, being able to connect um, and connect our uh, north side and south side lines uh, together, we do recognize that there's value in through routing of service, but we also believe that there's an opportunity to view uh, the improvements that are being made at Union Station and the existing service or the existing alignment, uh, the uh, relatively unique animal, the double stub-ended terminal at Union Station as, um, as an asset and not just an impediment to that. Um, there's a lot of different connections that you were wanting to make. And if we have a high quality station that where you can see from one set of platforms to the other and have uh, closely timed connections, um, then you're not only making connections from uh, one of our lines that operates north and or south and west to another one that operates uh, north and northwest, uh, but you have more ability to connect all of the lines that operate from um, the west and south to all of the lines that operate to the north and northwest. So there's an opportunity to that doesn't preclude uh, through routing, and, and we're still interested in seeing how we can do that. But um, knowing the um, that the design of uh, Union Station with um, with connections to our other uh, downtown terminals um, allows us to have uh, flexibility and potential to make those connections uh, within that, so that we're not having to necessarily so it's not only about picking and choosing one line on the south to align to one line on the north that we can still have a many to many connection um, as we work forward okay thanks we're getting close to the top of the hour here but i think we can get in maybe two or three more questions uh abe and arnold and, and several other people asked variations on questions about um the host railroads and, and what do they think about the, the plans uh, and changes in service that, uh, that Metra is, is contemplating? So we work really closely with them and we're, um, I, I, I don't think I can speak definitively to, um, they, they haven't produced a blanket statement that says we're rah-rah for regional rail and uh, expanded service, um, but they haven't uh, also given us saying there's no way that will ever happen. So um, there's still ongoing conversations um, that are out there. Uh, clearly that that does raise one element that I didn't stress earlier is because um, the, the beauty of the, the Metro name for and the, the Metro service mark uh, to customers is that um, all of our service, uh, the locomotives look uh, are the same, the same logos on every uh, conductor you interact with, but we have that incredible range of ownership and operating relationships that are underneath the, the Metro service mark. And so because of that, our ability to roll out regional rail may look a little differently on different lines, not only because of demand and um, that demand is not um, constant and the same across all of our lines and across the region, but also because of infrastructure and also because of operating ar arrangements and what can we do to push this out, how there's always going to be a give and take uh, 
uh, with our freight partners in order to uh, bring this to fruition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Peter asks, what's the status of replacing the A2 with A1? Uh, he says, it seems that that could be a way to route trains from, uh, from MD to Ogilvy and UP West trains into the Chicago Union Station. So we're, this is still part of something that we're looking at. Um, and we have, uh, it's, it's not a project that we're, that we have uh, capital funding to proceed on uh, in the in the next few years, but it is something that is um, is part of that. Not only um, does it have uh, does it result in possibilities as were described of rerouting possibilities, but it also is a key element uh, we believe of being able to serve the Fulton Market area, um, one of the fastest growing uh, business districts in the country. Great. Uh, David, you um, you alluded to this in your your presentation. The you know the the support and resources that uh, that Metro will need, but uh, that was before you got hit by all these uh, additional questions about you know all the things that people are asking about and asking for. And so I just wanted to ask again um, if there is anything that uh, anything more that you or that maybe Rick would like to say about uh, the resources that Metro will need to be able to carry forward with these plans. So one thing I didn't hit on that I do want to make sure that everyone is aware of that we're really actively engaged, um, and I know that I think there's some CMAP staff on the on the call um, that we're actively engaged with uh, the other service boards and with CMAP staff and a much larger uh, regional conversation about what happens as we approach uh, the fiscal operating cliff that all the transit agencies in uh, northeastern Illinois and really across the country are uh, going to face at uh, slightly different time frames um, over the next few years. But um, we anticipate that there's a, a significant operating cliff that we'll be facing as an agency um, in 2020, uh, 2025, 2026, as we move towards that um, at, or through the region in that 2025 to 2026 range. CMAP's been leading that effort, leading that conversation about how we can best address that. But there's going to be, um, pardon me, uh, there's going to be challenges um, moving forward to weigh those trade-offs about um, what the system we want versus the system um, and how to achieve that from a funding perspective. So um, continuing to be engaged in that, be aware of the conversation that will be happening at the regional level, and as that populates up to uh, the state legislature, the legislators re requested this uh, report from CMAP uh, be completed by the end of the year so that they can take action on it, hopefully um, in 2024. Um, but that's going to be a, a, a big ask for uh, a lot of us in the region and for, uh, for the legislature. So I'd encourage continued support for that, support for transit, support for passenger rail support for regional rail. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, David. And uh, I'm gonna turn things over to, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up, so I'll turn things over to Rick Harnish now. Yeah, Thanks, and, Rick. and this has been a really exciting presentation. Uh, please audience, watch for more in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna have some more on, on this topic. Um, in our vision, which can be of course, bigger than an agency's vision that, that is restricted uh, by real world funding. Uh, but um, I want to point out that the spring 2024 Illinois legislative session is going to be incredibly important to the future of not only METRA and, and modernizing METRA, uh, but expanding uh, Amtrak service or downstate regional rail service um, uh, in Illinois and throughout the region. Um, and it's difficult to do anything between the mountain ranges without fixing Chicago first. So even if you don't live in Illinois, the Illinois legislative session in 2024 is going to be very important because that's when these issues about what the funding will be will be debated. Um, additionally, right now, with the annual appropriation, um, we've got the House uh, Transportation, Housing and Urban Development Committee that has essentially said, we don't like passenger trains. Um, and so we need to rally support from all across the country to overcome that. Um, so uh, we're very happy that 
that you are participating in this as, as a listener and as a member. Um, and again, um, please support our efforts, uh, be part of it. Uh, we can help you understand what needs to happen and how you can make it happen as we move forward. So please go to hsrail.org slash swag and buy a, not buy, I'm sorry, make a donation and we'll send you a free t-shirt or hat that you can use to uh, get conversations going. So again, thank you, David, for such a great presentation and thank you all for participating. And we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.